Morning, Chris Hall, Wake Forest Baptist Health Infectious Diseases. It is the 22nd of April. And uh, if you remember, last year at this time, we were working to flatten the curve. Um, and that entailed being in lockdown uh, and taking other extreme measures across the country, including here in North Carolina and locally. Uh, and it worked. Uh, we flattened the curve there, at least we did here in North Carolina, because we got a head start. We started flattening uh, the curve before the curve really started to move up. And we're going to talk about that again in a minute, uh, because we're flattening the curve again, uh, but we're doing it a different way. So where are we uh, nationwide uh, with COVID? Um, so the number of new cases is, um, is kind of plateaued again uh, in, our, in our April wave. Um, so uh, there are some exceptions. Michigan's still in having a devil of a time, particularly up in the northeastern part of the state um, where case rates are over 100 per 100,000 for seven days. Um, and that reflects um, about what it was at the worst of January for some states like North Dakota, uh, and if you remember, and some of the places in, um, in Europe um, and, and even India. So um, middle of Minnesota, their case rates are a bit higher, parts of Colorado, eastern Pennsylvania, and a little bit of New Jersey. But overall, um, the increases have stalled, um, and even maybe in Michigan, we might start to see some decline now. Um, here in North Carolina, um, our cases um, still have continued to increase, although but slowly, including here in Forsyth County. Uh, our case rate in Forsyth County now is uh, 17 per 100,000 for seven days. Uh, up from uh, a low of about 10, uh, which it was three or four weeks ago. Our percent positives are about 5%, where they were about 3% um, three or four weeks ago. So uh, a modest increase. So it, when you look at the curves, and I encourage you to pull them up on the uh, state dashboard, um, this is a, a slow wave. Um, and uh, you know when normally you anticipate waves to take off exponentially and grow, and I predicted that we would have such of one in April, uh, but it's uh, it's really grown slowly, and that's good um, because uh, the slower it grows, the more time we have to get people vaccinated, uh, and the uh, and the more likelihood that uh, it won't be a major problem. Um, it does mean, though, that it'll probably last a bit longer. So normally, when I was saying a few weeks ago, I would anticipate that this wave or wavelet would have ended by um, middle to beginning to middle of May. Now it may not be um, until June. But the good news is it's not going to be as high. Um, so what we did was we flattened the curve for this wave that's happening right now. Uh, whereas a year ago, we did it with lockdowns and other extreme me uh, measures. Uh, this year, we uh, did it with uh, continuing to uh, uh, wear our masks um, and uh, be wise in our social interactions and by being vaccinated. And, uh, and it's made a difference. Probably nowhere uh, is it more evident how much vaccination has made a difference as in our nursing homes. Nursing home outbreaks are uh, almost unheard of now, um, whereas uh, a year ago they were, it was horrible. Um, and uh, another place is, uh, is in our hospitals. Um, right now, while our hospitalizations have gone up some in Forsyth County and the Triad area because of uh, our current wavelet, um, it's, um, they're not nearly what, what it would have been otherwise. And uh, um, business is pretty much as usual in hospitals. Surgeries are going on, both elective as well as non-elective. Um, get in and get your appointments, get seen, get your medical care done. Um, the hospitals are doing very well. Um, I, I know and no problems in hospitals with staffing or alternative care models or anything like that. 
anywhere in the state, at least not due to COVID. So um, our schools um, in the area are do still doing well in general. Um, case numbers are low. But um, as we talked about over the last couple weeks, you know, our kids aren't vaccinated. Um, and we are starting to see uh, cases of transmission from child to child, but not in the school. Um, it's in sometimes in the uh, after school curriculars, occasionally in athletics, <clears throat> play dates, sleepovers, um, and, uh, and social activities, household exposures. Um, so we're going to have to continue to be careful with our kids um, and, um, and be mindful um, that they can still get it. Interestingly, I've heard some things um, lately that are a little bit disturbing and frustrating about that from parents saying, well, you know, where the parents are vaccinated and, uh, and the grandparents are vaccinated, so maybe you should just let the kids get it and um, then we'll all be immune, right? So I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, it's not the time for the COVID version of the chicken pox party. Um, because um, while kids generally do do well when they get COVID, if you have a child who has it, and then there's a parent who, uh, or, and then there's a, a visit to grandparents or the grandparents come over, even though they're vaccinated, um, there is a chance they could get COVID uh, from the child. It's not high, we'll talk about it in a minute, but it is still possible. And I don't know if that's a risk anyone wants to take. Um, the other thing about kids getting it is, um, you know, they're going to be out of school um, for 10 days. Not a good time of year uh, to be home in quarantine um, rather than in class. Um, and, uh, and lastly, sometimes kids don't do as well. Um, it's unusual, but it does happen, including the uh, multi-system inflammatory disorder um, that we've heard about. Um, which is unusual, but can be quite severe in children. And occasionally there are, there are kids hospitalized with it. Doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So why take the risk? So instead, let's wait to get our kids vaccinated. And while we're waiting, let's just be mindful. I'm not saying don't let the kids go to the playground. Playgrounds are largely safe, unless they're packed with people. Um, I'm not saying don't let the kids have a play date. Um, but just be kind of careful about how you do it. Keep the bubble fusions down to a small number with the play dates. Sleepover, still not a good idea. Um, maybe if you're going to sleep over in the backyard and have separate tents, it's fine, but I don't, I've never met a 12-year-old who wants to be in a tent by themselves. So, <laughs> um, so let's hold off a little bit on some of these extended social activities. Um, and um, wait for a vaccine. Go into the swimming pool, it's probably okay. Supervised athletic events, probably okay, but watch out the, uh, for the uh, social interactions that can occur afterwards. Um, if you have a play date or you want to have an end, uh, end of little league party for the team, take it outside, do it outside. Um, and um, you know, just mind your distancing and masks are still important and our kids are wearing their masks so to them it's normal now so uh, just just something to keep in mind um, I think um, that um, graduations which are being planned um, I've seen a lot of the graduation plans for our schools in the area you know largely they all look pretty good I think it's going to be um, you know, fine to do so. Um, most of them have limited the numbers of guests. So um, um, you may get two tickets, four tickets, or maybe just immediate family to be there um, in, in person. They're largely outdoors or in, if indoors, in large venues. So if you have a uh, graduation like in Joel Coliseum, it's basically like being outside, um, so, so that's okay. Um, 
So um, check with your um, school, um, university, and such to see how graduation is going to be done, um, and um, and uh, be be mindful that sometimes there'll be attendance limits just to keep the crowds down in size. Um, some other activities that go on with uh, in this time of year with schools. We talked about last week prom. Um, when we talked about risk mitigation, if your child really, really, really wants to go to the prom. Not all of the school systems are having proms. Some places where the schools are not having it, uh, parents have gotten together to get um, private proms, PPs, I call them. And, um, and some of those are outdoors, some of them are indoors. You might want to check actually on what the safety plans are for the prom and then talk with your kids about before prom and after prom activities where social distancing is oftentimes not what is desired by the child. Um, and uh, if their child is 16 or older, let's get them vaccinated because they can get Pfizer's vaccine now. Um, and uh, talk to them about continuing to wear the mask, um, not piling a bunch of kids in one car, so on and so forth. It's just, a lot of it's just common sense. Um, so, um, announcement by the governor yesterday, I think it was by tweet, eventually, <laughs> maybe. But, um, so it looks like we might be relaxing some of our restrictions um, by or on June 1st uh, here in North Carolina. Um, and the ones that it looks like are going to be the ones that will be relaxed will have to do with mandatory social distancing, mandatory capacity limits um, in um, businesses, um, arenas, sports facilities, so on and so forth, um, and then the uh, numbers they can gather. So. Um, after June 1, if right now, um, well, right now you can have 100 people at an outdoor activity, which is a pretty big backyard barbecue. Uh, after June 1, you can invite 500 people to your backyard barbecue. Good luck cooking the burgers for that, though. Um, so, uh, so these restrictions will be lifted, so it won't be mandatory. Um, but. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily that um, it's still a good idea. Um, and, and I don't want to throw um, you know, a wet blanket on what seems like um, you know, progression to being normal. It just means use your own, own judgment a little bit. So if it's, um, if, if it's okay to have a whole bunch of people together um, for, a, for a party or a get together, it doesn't mean you have to invite as many as you can. Um, if all of a sudden now, now you want to have a wedding, uh, you want to have 150 guests, um, think about it. Is it really a good idea? Look at the venue. How can people spread out? What do you think the vaccination rates are in these people? Talk to the people whom you might be inviting. Um, because weddings, as we know, throughout the pandemic have been a place where super spreader events occur. And so because the governor says it's okay to have that many people, think about it for your own safety and for your own um, groups of friends and family. Um, it may be something you want to hold off on a little bit yet um, and, um, and see. So, so Big Brother won't be forcing us to do things, but um, that doesn't mean we still shouldn't be thinking about um, how to do something safely while there is still COVID circulating. And in the next three, four months, there is still going to be COVID circulating. Um, it won't be like it was in January or early February, but there still will be some circulating. Um, let's talk a little bit about vaccine. Um, so. Um, Nationwide, we basically hit the 50% uh, mark for 50% of the country now have gotten at least one vaccine. Hopefully most of those people will follow up and get their second, who are still pending. Um, and, um, and, and that's good. Is that herd immunity? No, uh, not, not really. Um, we probably we need to be up more around 70, perhaps even 80% of people who have either have had the vaccine or immune. Now you can throw some immune people who've had COVID, 
who haven't gotten vaccinated yet onto the top of that, so that might mean that our immunity rates are a bit higher than what just the vaccine rate is. Um, and, and here in Forsyth County, um, people have gotten COVID and are immune, um, um, are, are doing pretty well. Now you have to remember that immunity is not 100%, um, and it's not 100% after having had COVID. It seems like uh, people who, uh, who have had COVID in a three to four month period of time, about 80% of them don't get COVID again. So, I mean, that's pretty good. That's a good half, glass half full situation. But there are means that there's about 20% who might get it again. So, um, so it's not 100%. Same thing with vaccine. Um, while our, um, you know, I think that people tend to think that with vaccines, everything's all or none. And it's not that way with vaccines. Um, it, I mean, there's no vaccine that's all or none as far as protection goes. So um, we're getting more information um, as time goes by um, that, about what the risks are uh, of getting COVID once you're vaccinated. And this is in times when there's COVID, quite a bit of COVID transmission. Obviously, if there's not a much, much COVID in your community, the risk is gonna go down anyway. Um, but some studies uh, in healthcare workers suggest it's about 0.05%. Um, and uh, that's even during the time of, uh, of early January when there was a ton of COVID around. Uh, some uh, studies, one just came out um, in, the, um, in the New England Journal where it's 0.5 percent, but it, the, f the few number of people who got it in there uh, was like uh, out of 417 people, two out of the three who got it uh, actually got it within 20 days of having um, the, va the second dose of the vaccine, which is still a little bit early. We say two weeks, but four weeks is a little bit better. So, um, but 0.5 percent. Uh, I did some rough numbers here in North Carolina. We're below 0.1 percent. So um, people, so there's there's a lot of different ways of looking at what vaccines can do for you. Um, and you could either be um, on the sunny positive side, or you can be on the negative grouchy side about it. So let's talk a little bit about what that might mean. So um, somebody might say, hey. You know, there's people getting COVID who've been vaccinated, so why should I get the vaccine? Well, I just told you, your risk of getting it after you've been vaccinated is, uh, is about 0.5%. If you do things like masking and paying attention to some of those other things, it's gonna even go down for further than that. 0.5%, I mean, that's not real high. And, and actually, it's probably even a little lower than that. So. Um, so look at it on the positive side. What's your risk of getting COVID when there's widespread community transmission if you've not been vaccinated? Between five to 10%. So that's a 100% reduction. Um, so that's pretty good. And the people who do get it don't get hospitalized and they don't die if they've been vaccinated. Whereas if you're in a higher risk group and you haven't been vaccinated, and you get COVID, your risk of dying can be between four and 10%. I and mean, that's dying. So, so look at the positive side of it and don't focus on the, the very few breakthroughs. Um, I'm really, really excited about those numbers actually. That's probably one of the best numbers we've ever seen with a vaccine. So, so another thing that I'll hear is, wow, we're gonna need a booster anyway, so what's the use? Why, uh, why get vaccinated now? Because we'll probably have to be boosted. And it's, you know, if you gotta be boosted all the time, what's... Th okay, so diphtheria, you have to be boosted. Pertussis, whooping cough, you have to be boosted. Tetanus, we always have to be boosted. Measles, you get a second booster. Meningitis vaccine in high school students, you need a booster. I think you're picking up on where I'm going. A lot of vaccines need boosters and we're fine with it. In fact, sometimes being, having a booster of something is a good thing. You got a job in two years, you get a raise. That's a booster. You've just made more money. So if you're a five-year-old and you get your, 
you get your stool out, your booster stool, and now you can reach the cookie jar. That's a good thing. So boosters aren't necessarily a negative thing at all. And in fact, in this case, the fact that we're going to have boosters available when we need to use them, and we still don't know yet exactly when that booster might be, um, they're going to cover the variants that are out there. So you even get more protection from your vaccine. So um, that's like getting an upgrade. So instead of calling them boosters, let's call them upgrades. Um, and upgrades are always good. So, and then the last thing is, is, well, vaccines could have side effects. So let's talk about, for instance, Johnson & Johnson. So um, tomorrow, um, the, uh, I think we're going to hear that Johnson & Johnson's vaccine is coming back from its pause. Uh, the number of cases of, of blood clots that potentially have been associated with the vaccine are extremely small. While there is some biologic possibility that the, uh, that the cases were associated with the vaccine, the statistics are such that it's, it's going to be impossible to know 100% whether they really are, which means that they're so rare we couldn't figure it out um, by statistics. Um, and you have to take into account what your risks are. So your risk of dying if you get COVID and you have other medical problems is around 5%. Your risk of having a potential blood clot from Johnson & Johnson's vaccines is about one in a million. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a benefit to risk ratio. And we do these benefit to risks analysis all of the time in our lives, right? You know, you, you get benefit for driving to the beach for a vacation, but you accept the risk that there may be a very serious car accident on the way that was totally out of your control. Um, we play baseball, Little League, out in the springtime, and occasionally you get freak lightning strikes. Um, that can happen even when you're not anticipating them. We accept that risk because the benefit of having Little League baseball makes it worth it and the risk of a lightning strike as well, so on and so forth. So we, we, we do this in our lives all the time. So what I think is going to happen with Johnson & Johnson's vaccine, they're going to come out and say, they call it a warning in the FDA world, that the risk of this is roughly one in a million um, and that the risk-benefit ratio of getting that vaccine needs to be weighed with the benefit of getting it and, um, and the benefit of getting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine clearly outweighs any risk that may be associated with it. Um, and I, I feel very strongly about that, and I'll back up my words on that. So, um, um, so I think that's what's going to happen with, uh, with J&J's vaccine tomorrow. Um, one thing about vaccination, um, at least I can speak here in North Carolina, but I think it's this way across the country is that we've hit a little bit of a wall because a lot of the people who really, really wanted the vaccine have now gotten it. So now it's the people who are um, either worried and thus hesitant about whether the, the vaccine is, is worth it for them and their benefit to risk ratio analysis. Um, and then there are some people who are just apathetic. Eh, COVID vaccine, eh. Um, and then there are some people who are just procrastinators. Um, and those of you who are procrastinators know who you are. So let's go ahead and get vaccinated now um, and we can get out of this a lot quicker. You want these restrictions by the, to be lifted by the governor, restrict faster? You want the mask restriction to go away? Let's just get vaccinated. Um, and we particularly, I'm, I'm talking about the younger people where there may be more apathy and procrastination. Um, and so uh, it's a good time to get vaccinated. Uh, and it's easy. The appointments, uh, we have appointment slots open all the time. So it's not as hard as it was at all. So uh, get a hold of the uh, um, Public Health Department's website or you can call. For here in our uh, health system, you can call 336-70-COVID, make your vaccine appointment, and there are open appointments. You can also go through your My, My Wake Health address uh, account. And um, um, so there's, there's vaccine events happening all over the place. Uh, look at your community calendars, social websites and such. 
and let's get vaccinated. Um, you know, if you're 16 or over, you can get vaccinated. And this is their ticket for having a normal season next year for our school, for our high schools. If we can get, you know, a good number, 70 to 80% of our high school students vaccinated by next fall, you're gonna have football, you're gonna have wrestling, you're gonna have every sport you want, you're gonna have social activities, you're gonna have proms, and you won't have people bugging you all the time about staying apart. Um, and this is how we're gonna have a normal school season next year. Same thing for universities. There is virtually no way that we are going to have a normal school year for a residence hall oriented university or college without having a majority of the students vaccinated. You just won't be able to do it because in the dorms, the parties, um, the social get togethers and just how high school, I mean, how college kids interact, there's no way you've seen over the last uh, year, um, you know, just about every college who's had in-person people, doesn't even have to be in-person classes, but just people on the campus has had a problem with an outbreak, some large, some small. The only way we're going to have a normal year for a university or college is to be vaccinated. And this is why you're hearing more and more and more universities that are going to be mandating vaccines for the returning students this fall, um, including Wake Forest. Now, Wake Forest has done a great job actually getting their students vaccinated. And it's made a difference down there um, since February. Um, COVID's been a pretty rare event on campus, so it works. So if you're a college student and you wanna have a normal college year, including your frat parties, a normal rush, um, normal social, social interactions, having the lounges open in the dorms, just get vaccinated. Um, and that's why the colleges are asking to do it mandatory. And I uh, support that 100%. So I support Wake Forest's decision to have mandatory vaccination for the fall 100%. I think it's a great idea. Um, so a little bit about um, vaccine, a little bit about where our numbers are going with COVID. Uh, and a little bit on what's on the horizon for um, releasing of some restrictions, at least um, locally. Um, the masks, however, I think are gonna be around for a while yet. As long as there's COVID circulating, um, I think we're gonna be wearing masks. And um, um, outside, I don't know. If you're you know, in a packed, crowded area, sure. But you know, if people are spread out um, and you're outside, you know, you don't, don't need to wear a mask, I don't think. Um, and that may be eased on the 1st of July also, or 1st of June, um, the outside thing for masks. But um, so anyway, is there any, uh, any questions? Um, yeah. I do have one. Um, there, I don't know if this has been from people saying this has happened to them, but we have heard that people that got their second dose, their side effects were bad if they got the do second dose in the same arm. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, so, so my friend at WXII asks, <laughs> is, uh, is there any truth to the fact that if you get your second dose in the same arm that you got your first dose, that your expected reactions, you know, the pain and the swelling and the fever and such, is worse. No, it turns out it doesn't matter. Um, either arm. So if you're right-handed, you know you can get them both in the left arm because it gets a little sore afterwards. And so you can do your gardening or play tennis or whatever. A little easier if it's in the non-dependent arm. But no, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. That's a good question. So, any others? Yeah, so if you've had COVID, you should get vaccinated, and there's several reasons why. One is, is that the, uh, the vaccine boosts your immunity that you got from the natural infection. Two is that the vaccine-induced immunity is better against variants than the natural infection is. Um, and, um, and, that, and the variants are pretty prevalent now. Um, so that's what most people are getting are the variants. 
Um, and then, um, and so, and thirdly, is that your, um, your ability to not have to quarantine and, um, and or be tested after being exposed for a vaccine right now is there's no time limit. Whereas if you've had an infection, the time limit's three months. And then lastly, and we, we really haven't talked about it, but if you're thinking of traveling um, and or doing certain activities like going to the theater, it may be that you're going to have to show proof of vaccination. And we can talk more about vaccine passports next week. Um, there's a lot, still a lot of discussion about it. But, um, but I can tell you for travel, um, having had COVID, you're going to have to show proof that you've had COVID in the last three months. Um, and, um, and then you're going to need to be tested. Whereas if you've been vaccinated and you're traveling, like say to, to England, um, um, you can show that proof of vaccination and you won't need to do either of those and you won't need to quarantine. So there is an advantage to getting vaccinated if you want to have some normal activities that involve traveling around, particularly Europe. Europe's going to be very strict on that, I think. So France and England are talking about um, allowing, um, allowing people from the United States to come at some point. France may be even as early as next month, but you're going to have to show that you've been vaccinated or you're going to be quarantining for two weeks. And the whole quarantine hotels that are mandated are usually not the nicer ones. So, All right, with that, um, we'll see you next week. Oh, mark your calendars, 8th and 9th of May, uh, the DASH opening weekend. You can get a Dr. Old Bobblehead if you're one of the first 500 people um, to get in the gates at the game. So uh, let's all play baseball. That'll feel a little bit normal. <laughs>